Hai Dr. Halo. So ah uh, to test run is it? Maybe should I share the screen now or later? Mm, mm, now it's okay. Uh, Mabel, Mabel, so yep. Mabel, uh, this yep. is the first of the series, right? The whole series Correct. from College of Physicians, uh, right? No, this is the second already. Second, the, the, the okay. first one was on what topic? Huh? Gastro. Gastro was last month, that means it? One, yeah, one topic a month. month. All right, yep. and this, is, this program is going to be like weekly for the entire year, is, it? is that yes, the plan? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. So this is the second of the series uh, for infectious diseases, yep. right? Correct. Okay. 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 And, and normally, what is the audience like? Um, how, how big is the audience? Do you know? Uh, previously, we have about like from about 180 to 200. Mm -hmm. Wow. People not working. No need to work on. Part of CME. That's all. Oh, points there. Eh? Wonder. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mabel, you're in, what, you're in uh, typing, is it? Yes, I'm in typing. Oh, so the whole typing team is doing it, is it? Yeah, correct. Oh, because Dr. Letch bully you all, is it? Oh, very good. Okay, jolly good. Okay, the, shall we start? You're the boss. You will do whatever you want to do. Okay, Dr. Ang ready, uh, yeah. Uh, let's check, check Dr. Ang first, the most important. Dr. Ang ready, Dr. Yeah. Chow? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Chow... Is she, was she in? Is she in? Um, or, or maybe I ask her to join my PC. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what will be on the screen uh, for the audience? What will they see? They are seeing this slide now, is it? Yeah, they're seeing the slides already. Okay. okay. So when I talk, I, I won't be on, uh, is it? I'll just talk now, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me know. All right. No she should be in the participate list. Uh, list. Okay, Dr. Chan is in. Mabel? Okay. Can start. Okay. So hello and good afternoon everyone. Is everybody ready? Yes, we are. All right. 
So hello and good afternoon. Uh, I trust everyone has had a good Christmas and a good New Year's. So welcome back to our weekly webinar series, uh, which is organized by the College of Physicians Malaysia. And so to kickstart the month of January 2021, uh, what better team than infectious disease? So we have a series of interesting and relevant topics lined up for you guys uh, the entire month. So whoever who hasn't registered, please do so and join us. Uh, no COVID topics, don't worry. I think we've all had quite a bit of COVID topics the entire year. So uh, without further ado, <laughs> uh, I have Dr. Ang as our speaker for today and Dato Dr. Christopher and Dr. Chow as our chairperson. Over to you, Dato Dr. Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mabel. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was very surprised we're not talking about COVID. Okay, we will try very hard not to talk about COVID. Okay, uh, now, the topic today, of course, is, uh, uh, as you can see on the slide, is why antibiotics. And I'm sure you understand why we are talking about this now. Uh, even before this current pandemic, we have already another pandemic for the last, I guess, couple of decades. Uh, and we all know about antibiotic resistance. Um, of course, the, last year and probably this year as well, we'll be a lot more focused on certain viruses. But clearly, in terms of antibiotic resistance, it continues to climb. I'll just start as a preamble that in 2014, uh, two, U two UK Prime Ministers ago, that is uh, David Cameron, uh, no, not the one with the funny hairstyle, but David Cameron, two Prime Ministers ago, commissioned uh, Sir Jim O'Neill, uh, a famous British economist, to do a review on AMR, or antimicrobial resistance. And he took two years for his team to come up with a document, and which was published in 2016. And in that, it was a very frightening, uh, non-biased look at it because he's an economist. But looking at all the data that we had, uh, they estimated that AMR will be the number one cause of death in humankind by the year 2050. Uh, it will outshadow all the other main causes of death, and that is frightening. The other thing that he also was very uh, sobering is the fact that a lot of the advances in medicine that we achieve over the many centuries, if you like, uh, will be impacted negatively upon, including all our top our types of modern types of surgery now, transplants, prostheses, uh, and all the other medications that we have come up with. So it is something obviously very serious. So based on that, obviously, uh, some recommendations were put out uh, and the world was given warning which uh, many international agencies, including WHO, uh, took notice of. Unfortunately, last year in 2019, I think end of the year, uh, Chatham House, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with, it's a policy uh, institute based in the UK, uh, did a review about the progress of uh, AMR and work against AMR since the document by Jim O'Neill. And the bad news is that we have not gone far enough. The progress, there was some progress made, but the progress was actually uh, quite far behind. And so based on that, there were many things that they wanted us to do even better. For today, I guess the College of Physicians sees this as an important topic. And I'm, for that, I'm very grateful uh, to the College of Physicians. And today, because we're talking to clinicians, uh, Dr. Ang, our speaker today, will highlight on why we use antibiotics. Uh, I'm sure you noticed the antibiotic spelling is wrong. It's just to make sure that no one is falling asleep yet. Thank you, Dr. Ang, for that trick. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I will leave the topic uh, uh, for Dr. Ang to describe herself, but I would like now to invite my co-chairperson, Dr. Chow Ting Su, the ID physician, the ID head in uh, Hospital Pula Pinang, uh, to take over the floor. Uh, Ting Su? Yes, that's all. Thank you very much for that kind introduction uh, to myself and also for Dr. Uh, Ang. As we all know, currently we are facing with a lot of uh, AMR, antimicrobial resistance in our tertiary hospital. I'm sure uh, whoever is working in a tertiary hospital will not be, uh, what do you call that, a surprise that you will have a carbapenem resistance enterobacter CAE and also Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is all pen drug resistance occurring in your ICUs and your high dependency care, care unit. 
and that actually actually um, uh, always always cause a lot of problems for the patients and also infection control. So without further delay, I would like to introduce my uh, to be consultant, Dr. Ang Peng Peng, who has actually finished and completed her infectious disease training with uh, Dato, myself, and also uh, Dr. Suresh and Dato Mahiran. And she just returned from the land under Sydney. Okay, she just came back from Sydney. And here she is going to share with us her view on why we should not over-prescribe antibiotics and how do we how do we learn to be a smart prescriber? Okay, Dr. Ang. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Ang, ID specialist from Hospital Penang. Thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, share with you my experience and then. So um, today's topic uh, why antibiotic and the smart prescriber. How do I go to the next slide? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So today there's only uh, one objective that uh, I hope that I could achieve. Hope that after today's talk, uh, most of you can be more confident in choosing the appropriate antibiotic for your patients. I still remember when I'm still, uh, I was a young physician or young doctors in a medical field. I always struggle. I really don't know what antibiotic is the best for my patients. I believe that uh, most of you will agree with me, but it's so malu to tell people I actually don't know what to choose, isn't it? Especially you are a specialist and your MO are looking for you, a uh, houseman is looking at you. So trust me, I've been struggling even until now I'm still learning. So what I do is uh, if I know that the patient ended up in ID cubicle, I'll try to use omentin, you know, because I very scared uh, Dr. Chow tomorrow will come and scold me if I use something greater than omentin. But actually I was wrong. I remember I was uh, scolded by her one day because I use uh, omentin for a very, very sick patient. So people always talk that uh, ID, infectious disease, always want us to stop antibiotic, always only want us to use omentin. Let me tell you, this is not true. What we want to... Um, uh, teach you all is to use an uh, antibiotic appropriately. If you could use an uh, antibiotic appropriately, there is nothing wrong that even you want to use tazosin or even you want to use meropenem. Okay? A study shown that 75% of antibiotic usage is inappropriate, meaning that today now is already 3.15 p.m. If today you already prescribed about uh, antibiotic to 10, 10 patients in your ward, let's say. So about seven patients, you, you are actually given them an inappropriate antibiotic, okay? So what do we mean by inappropriate antibiotic usage? Is when you give antibiotic when it's not necessary or either you use the wrong antibiotic or you use the correct one, but unfortunately you prolong using it, uh, continue using it when it's no longer necessary, or you are dealing with a very sensitive organism, you still using a broader spectrum, you didn't downgrade or de-escalate your antibiotic, or you are using the correct choice, uh, giving the correct duration, but unfortunately you given wrong dose. When we talk about wrong dose, it could be supra dose, too high, or uh, underdose your patients. So if you, if any five of these occur, meaning that antibiotic usage is inappropriate. So again, why we all keep on going around and tell uh, people that try to use antibiotic wisely, try to uh, learn how to use it appropriately, because there is a lot of serious issue that associated with inappropriate usage of antibiotic. First, all of you know very well, uh, inappropriate usage of antibiotic can actually promote resistance of organism. We have a lot of CRE, we have a lot of cholesterol resistant enterobacteria nowadays, and seriously tell you, we don't know how to treat, we do not have an uh, effective antibiotic to deal with this issue. So another, uh, uh, another serious uh, side effect, a uh, serious issue with inappropriate usage of antibiotic is side effect. Imagine if your patient do not require antibiotic and you use it, you can actually uh, bring your patient, uh, render your patient to a potential life-threatening side effect like hypersensitivity, anaphylactic shock, 
you know, we do have patients come in with acute renal failure requiring dialysis due to Bactrim. Then of, uh, if using a wrong antibiotic, a wrong dose, wrong duration, your patient uh, won't, won't be recovered quickly and uh, it will increase the morbidity and mortality. If that occur, then it will definitely increase the hospital cost. Then you might be asking me, I, uh, Dr. An, hospital cost increase is nothing to do with me. No, we are the taxpayer. And if you don't care about all this, then you please never ask for increment of salary. All right. So by now, if we still don't want to tackle issue with antimicrobial resistance, it was postulated by the year of 2050, every three seconds there will be one person die because of uh, AMR. So this uh, mortality, this rate of uh, number is actually far more higher than what we are facing for COVID. Okay, so something need to be uh, done, action need to be taken now. That's why all of you and myself is here today, all right? So now, appropriate usage of antibiotic, then how? What do you mean by uh, appropriate usage of antibiotic? It is occur when you give a appropriate, there is an appropriate and clear indication to use antibiotic. Then you choose the appropriate drug and you choose the appropriate dose and choose the appropriate route and you plan for appropriate duration. And after all this is done and make sure the correct information goes to your staff nurse, goes to your colleague, goes to your pharmacy and to the patients. There is no point that you have done everything correctly, but the, the patient uh, was given the wrong medication. So let's look at it uh, 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 point by point to make you understand what I mean by appropriate indication. Every time before you start a patient with antibiotic, always ask yourself, antibiotic per luca. Okay, antibiotic is only useful for bacterial infection. Not all fever are due to infections. We can have tumor fever, we can have acute leukemia come in with only fever, we can have dengue which, which is virus, we can have malaria fever. Okay, so not all the fever are actually due to infection. Autoimmune disease also patient can present it with fever. And all, not all the infection are due to bacteria. If you are sure the fever is due to infection, but not all infection is due to bacteria. And antibiotic is only useful for bacterial infection. There is no role for secondary, uh, to primary prevent your patient. You know your patient have viral infection. You want to prevent secondary bacterial infection. So you give antibiotic upfront. This is no evidence to support this kind of usage uh, unless you are talking about immunocompromised host, uh, people who, have, who are, who are post-transplants, okay? Even if you are dealing with bacterial infection, there are not all the bacterial infection will require antibiotic. For example, a very simple skin abscess, just a simple IND, your patient might not require antibiotic. Even if antibiotic is required, you don't need to give prolonged antibiotic. For example, some doctors want to keep antibiotic for one month, for six weeks, until the abdominal drain is off the uh, post mastectomy or uh, drain is off. Actually, you don't need to do that. All right. So now, um, appropriate drugs. This is the uh, the point that I think everybody want to know how to choose antibiotic. Always struggle, don't know what to do. Whenever we say use an appropriate antibiotic for your patient, everybody automatically by reflection, carbapenem will come to your brain. Appropriate antibiotic means carbapenem. Why is this so? because carbapenem has broader spectrum and he can cover ESBL. So we always have a just in case culture, just in case, you know, I want to cover just in case. Because of this culture, just in case, uh, and I want to cover, then everybody want to use carbapenem. You won't go wrong with carbapenem. This is what we believe. You won't go wrong with carbapenem. If you don't know what to give, you give carbapenem. But let me tell you, this is not true, okay? If I see any physician give carbapenem without a clear indication, I know actually this clinician know nothing about antibiotic. If you think that you want to act clever in front of your MO or in front of your junior that, oh, I'm very good, you know, so I prescribe carbapenem, then I'm telling you, when you do that, we know you know very little about antibiotic. 
If you think giving patient carbapenem will be safe, you can sleep tonight, you cover everything, you are wrong. Carbapenem can't cover MRSA. Carbapenem can't treat your malaria. Carbapenem can't treat your hospital-acquired and ICU-acquired infection like sternoprofomonas infection or your CRE. Carbapenem can't treat your TB. Carbapenem can't treat your PJP. So if you think, when I'm not sure, I give carbapenem, I'm very safe, then you are really wrong, okay? This is my favorite comic, uh, uh, one pine normal saline. So it's just an end. Why do you need to use a bomb to kill an end? I don't care. You know, this is like, it's just a sensitive E. coli. Why do you want to use barrel penum? And the answer is, I don't care. I just want the E. coli to die. Okay, then if it's, now there is no end. Why you want to use meropenum? This is not bacterial infection. Why do you want to use meropenum? I don't care. Okay, now meropenum destroy every, everything. I don't care. So we got super bug now. I don't care. So this is actually the realistic that we are facing in infectious disease. Okay. A lot of uh, clinicians outside infectious disease, they think AMR is not their issue. AMR should refer to ID. Uh, it's nothing to do with us. Let me tell you, when you refer IDMR, it's too late because we also don't know what to do. We do not have a good, uh, we do not have an effective antibiotic. So by the time you refer to ID for MR, we also don't know what to do. All right. So imagine if you think that MR is only ID problem. Let's say you are seeing patient in your endocrine clinic. If you do not control the antibiotic usage, you, you do not use antibiotic appropriately, and your patient will keep on coming back with an infected uh, uh, diabetic foot ulcer or recurrent bacteremia or carbuncle infection, then you can't, keep, you can't treat your patient, diabetic patient, with optimal um, strategy because due to the recurrent infection, there is no way you can control the DM. Another example for hematol patients. Acute leukemia, acute uh, uh, lymphoma, you need a lot of chemotherapy or even transplants. If you do not control the, the infection and you did not control an MR issue, your patient keep coming back with a bacteremia or MR bacteremia, we, we don't know how to treat. And that can cause your patient delay in receiving chemotherapy. And there's no way your patient can survive. Another good example is autoimmune disease, SLE. You can't optimize your steroid. You can't optimize your immunomodulatory drugs because of recurrent infection. So do you really think that uh, infection and MR is only infectious disease business? No. So same thing go to the surgical field. Uh, the autosurgeon put in an implant for total knee replacement, total hip replacement. If the implant is infected by a multi-drug resistant organism, we don't know what to treat. We don't know how to treat. The only option is to take it out. So when this happens, your, your name, your reputation as a good surgeon will actually come down. Then the patient will go around and say, this surgeon not good. You know, I come in for implant, I got an infection and she don't know how to, how to treat. She take out the implant. So um, MR infection is everybody's problem. Now I'm showing you this uh, antibiotic algorithm me. As what I told you when I was a junior doctor, I really struggled. I really don't know what antibiotic to give. And I remember this is a Bible that passed uh, generation by generation. I believe some of you are still laughing already. You must be really familiar with this. So what our senior used to teach us is, don't worry. Any patient coming from community, six week never at me hospital, you give them omentane. Or maintain not work, you upgrade to captrizone. Captrizone not working, you upgrade to tazosin. Tazosin not working, you upgrade to meropenem. And I'm still seeing a lot of junior doctors are practicing using this so-called algorithm myth. And if your patient is uh, believed to have hospital acquired infection, just discharge, then patient come in, no need to think. Just give tazosin, you will never be wrong. If not responding, you give meropenem. Not responding, you call ID. So, if you are still practicing this uh, algorithm, uh, using augmenting double jalan, use captrizone, captrizone double jalan, use tazosin, I'm tell you, telling you, you are failing. You fail to treat your patient appropriately. Okay, please. After today's talk, um, hopefully there is no more. I'm um, no more seeing this kind of algorithm in a patient's, uh, um, in our clinical field. So how do we choose an appropriate antibiotic for patient? If you don't want, if I say please don't, don't follow the algorithm. 
So whenever you think of what antibiotic to choose, if you are struggling, you are not sure, look at this. Based on etiology agent, based on patient's factor, based on antibiotic factors. I'm going to stay a little bit longer in this slide to make you understand, to help you in deciding what antibiotic to choose for your patient. So first, you should think of, if you believe that your patient had infection, you, you are very sure your patient had bacterial infection, now you move on to choose the uh, appropriate antibiotic for your patient. The first thing you should think of, what is the possible source of the infection? You, because this can lead you to a, a likely, likely organism and what likelihood that the organism will be, only you choose the correct antibiotic. For example, if your patient has a lung infection, you know the commonness is strep, uh, streptococcus pneumonia or Klebsiella pneumonia. Then you know that your patient never have a hospitalization, never take a broad spectrum antibiotic. So he, you might dealing with a sensitive bug. If it's strep, if it's capsella, omentin, eunacin is actually more than enough. But let's say your source of infection is the skin abscess. You know the likelihood organism is staph aureus. Staph aureus, you can actually use cefazolin. You can, uh, you can use cefazolin, coxacillin. If this is uh, UTI, the source is from your uh, urinary tract. And the most likely pathogen is E. coli. So E. coli, if patient have no risk of uh, resistance, no recent hospitalization, no uh, recent exposure to broad spectrum, then you can also use your unacin or mentin. That's more than enough. You don't need to go for a higher broader spectrum like your uh, tazosin meropenem. So if you going to use the algorithm that I uh, I talked to you just now, uh, I show you just now, it's going to be really dangerous. Just imagine that a patient who never admitted is a farmer coming because of lung infection and have a poorly controlled DM. What could it be? This could be amyloidosis. If you follow the algorithm, you are going to start patient with augmenting. Augmenting not working, you are going to start cefrizone. Cefrizone not working, you will upgrade to tazosin and this will happen after one week. So in a myeloidosis patient, you might be given a wrong antibiotic for the initial one week. So this is very dangerous if you follow the algorithm. Okay. Then after you look into the possible source, uh, another very good example is your end-stage renal failure patient dialysis via IJC. Then this is possible hospital acquired. If you follow the, the uh, previous algorithm, hospital acquired, your first line will be tazosin. But if you look at the patient, catheter site is inflamed and a patient just discharged with MRSA infection, then now the empirical treatment for this end-stage renal failure patient, you, you might thinking to cover MRSA rather than just give tazosin. That's why I want you guys to get rid away of those traditional algorithms. When you think that your patient has bacterial infection, ask yourself, what is the source? Where is the site? And what is the likely organism? Only you choose the antibiotic. Okay? So after you choose that, you, you, you identify the likelihood, you have to make a guess. Even I'm guessing until the culture come back. Okay? You are, you are making a guess. Let's say this is UTI. You think this is urosepsis, E. coli. Then now, you have to look back your patient's previous record. Maybe your patient had been having a recurrent UTI, already taking a lot of IM catrizone from GP. Then, then you, you, will, you might be thinking, oh, augmenting might not be working anymore because my patient had been taking a weekly catrizone or weekly augmenting from a GP. So this is how you choose your antibiotic and you have a justification why you want to use a broader spectrum. All right, and please bear in mind that um, when you are start using, uh, I, I can see because everybody's uh, using smartphone, you can actually Google, you know, up to date IDSA guideline, uh, Sanford guideline, Medscape to look for what is the antibiotic suggest, suggested, anti recommended antibiotic for uh, hospital acquired pneumonia for hospital acquire um, uh, whatever infection. But when you look at the international guideline, you must be careful because our local resistant pattern will be really different from them. For example, uh, MRSA rate in USA and UK is really high. So for all the hospital acquired infection and high-risk patient, upfront, the guideline will tell you to add in 
vancomycin. But you cannot apply to our local setting because our MRSA rate is still very low and we do not need to upfront cover patient with MRSA unless your patient have a previous record with a MRSA carrier, recurrent MRSA infection, then yes. Uh, when day one you see patient, if you say you want, you want to use vancomycin to cover, fair enough, all right? So before I move on, give you another example. Let's say now we are dealing with urosepsis, but patient do not require ICU admission. You, you think this is urosepsis, the likelihood uh, uh, organism E. coli, and there is no recent hospitalization, there is no catheter, there is no... Um, recent antibiotic exposure. So you might be dealing with a sensitive organism. So you think you can use omentin, you can use eunacin, you can use catrizon, you can use tazosin. Of course, you can use meropenem. So now how to choose? I have, I have shortlisted five antibiotic here. So I will move to patient's factor, okay? I'll move to patient factor, you know, um, Severity, okay, this is severe, no patient require double inotrope now. Maybe augmenting, I'm not comfortable in a very ill patient. I want to have a little bit, a broader spectrum, yes. Then you were thinking, maybe I want to go for catrizone and tazosin. Then you look at the physiological uh, function. If patient have a hypoalbuminemia, then catrizone is not a good option, okay? And if you want to use tazosin and you ask your patient, in fact, your patient have a penicillin or beta lactam allergy, then you might not want to even try to use a tazosin. So this is all the factors that you need to consider when you want to choose an appropriate antibiotic for your patients. All right. Then after you have shortlisted your antibiotic to one or two, you roughly know which one you want to choose. You double check again whether you are choosing the correct one or not, whether patient on other uh, medication could have interact with the antibiotic that you use. You do not need to memorize all this. You, know? you can just book up your smartphone. You, you can just Google it, drug to drug interaction. Everything will come out, okay? So let me give you an example when we talk about uh, PKPD and uh, we talk about site of infection. For example, I have a patient come in with a MRSA osteomyelitis due to a previous implant, uh, infected implant. So implant already taken away, but unfortunately patient uh, osteomyelitis is quite difficult to heal. And every time she come in for a bone department, the bone, uh, the bone culture, the tissue culture still grow MRSA. So after I treat her with a one or two weeks of vancomycin patient response, the, the wound all looks very good. So I change patient to oral agent, maybe Bactrim or maybe Rifampicin. Then the, uh, the, some doctors will come back to me and say, Dr. Ang, why are you downgrading antibiotic? My patient is so bad, you know, recurrent MRSA OM. Why are you downgrading? So if you know this knowledge, this is not downgrading. In fact, I will say I'm upgrading my patient's uh, uh, treatment because I'm using a, a very good agents that have a best tissue penetration and best bone penetration compared to vancomycin. So instead of downgrading, actually I'm upgrading the treatment. Okay, so sometimes when you choose antibiotic, you also have to consider the site of infection. Like elderly men that come in, you believe have prostate prostatitis, instead of using uh, Zinasef, actually, you know, ciprofosacin have an excellent prostate penetration. So they will say, oh, Dr. Ang, why you downgrade again? And this is not downgrading, all right? So uh, next, I'll quickly move on because of time limit, uh, appropriate dosage. If you are very sure this is bacterial infection and source has control, you already choose the appropriate antibiotic, now you must decide a dose for your patient. You don't need to read all this. I'm just trying to tell you that there is no such thing called one dose fits all. There is no such thing that you learn uh, Tazosin 4.5 gram QID, it will fit everybody, no. Uh, augmenting 1.2 gram TDS fits for everybody, no. So PKPD is very important. Now we are increasingly know, knowing that this knowledge there is no, uh, we can't follow what pharmaceutical company recommendation because our patient pathof, uh, physiological changes. Today, your patient creatinine can be 130. Tomorrow can be 85. Today's your patient albumin can be 30. Tomorrow can be 25. Today, your patient do not require inotrope and tomorrow your patient require inotrope. So every day, your patient's physiologically was change, is changing every day. So there is nothing that one dose fits all. 
okay? And it, to make you understand about PKPD, I can't do that with only one or two slides. It's something that we really need to attend a workshop. We really need to um, practice to make you remember. But very quickly and briefly, um, we need to learn which kind of antibiotic is time dependent for kill, uh, bacteria killing effect, uh, which kind of antibiotic is concentration dependent. So on all our beta latum antibiotic, your, your penicillin, your cephrizone, your tazosin, meropenem, all of them are time dependent. All the antibiotic that require TDM checking for toxicity, your gentamicin, your vancomycin, your amikacin are concentration dependent. This knowledge is very important. i uh, give you an example. Let's say a patient, you are giving her IV cefepine 1 gram TDS for uh, whatever hospital acquired pneumonia that you believe, 1 gram TDS or cefepine. And then your patient getting sicker and sicker in ICU, um, not getting better. And sometimes people will come and ask me, I, I feel that patient uh, one gram TDS or cefepine not enough because she is on hemodialysis, she is on ECMO, she is on uh, inotrope. I want to optimize it. Should I go for two gram BD cefepine or should I go to one gram TDS? So if you know this concept, you don't need to ask me. Cefepine is a time-dependent uh, antibiotic. If you want to optimize it, you maintain the frequency. You maintain the time, overall time, the antibiotic concentration above the MIC. So I will tell you in your patient, uh, if time-dependent antibiotic, I prefer you to keep it at TDS rather than you change it to 2 gram BD. So another example about concentration dependence, you need a highest loading dose of concentration for killing uh, effect and it's not so much the uh, important it is not really important to keep the antibiotic concentration uh, above the MIC when the time goes this is concentration dependence antibiotic for example your amikacin you give your patient 500 stat you give your patient 750 mg stat you don't divide them into IV amikacin 250 BD you give it stat dose higher highest possible stat dose because you know that uh, this antibiotic fall into the concentration dependence group. Okay, I hope you all understand. Right. So our patient, like what I say, daily, your patient physiologically is changing, so that you can you can decide on a dose for this patient and for one week or for ten days. It won't work this way, especially if you are dealing with ICU and critically ill patient. Every day they have a different volume of distribution. They have different kidney function, hepatic function. Sometimes they might need more. They might need CRRT. Sometimes, sometimes they might not need, you know, things like that. So uh, you must review your patient dosage every day. So this is another important thing that I want to bring up. If you all realize, if you have worked with an ID team before, you know that a lot of time we ask you try to avoid an IV catrizone, try to avoid a tapinum unless we really have no other alternative. Why is it so? Because there are certain antibiotics, they are heavily protein bound. You look at catrizone, 95% protein bound. Meaning that if you think you are given, you are giving your patient a very good dose of capraizone one gram BD or two gram daily, whatever that your patient, um, the, the capraizone that go into your patient and start killing the, the, the bacteria is less than one gram because the rest are heavily protein bound. So when your antibiotic is, the antibiotic that working to kill the organism are free antibiotic. If your antibiotic is bound to the protein, it can't work. Okay, that is the reason Caprizon is a good antibiotic, but unfortunately, it's highly protein bound. You, you will tend to underdose your patient. Yes, you give 2 gram OD, but whatever patient receives, actually, it's not 2 gram OD. Okay, so quickly, I move to appropriate routes. Uh, should I use IV? Should I use uh, oral? Traditionally, we always say a sickest patient try to use IV, don't use oral. This is not, uh, this is not because the oral antibiotic is not good. Actually, most of our oral antibiotic is, um, hold on, uh, sorry. Okay, so uh, most of our oral antibiotic nowadays are uh, very improved formulation with a very excellent bioavailability, meaning that, uh, for example, Bactrim IV oral is similar uh, uh, 
similar efficacy. Uh, augmenting oral IV same, Yonasin oral IV same. Yeah. But we still telling you that try to use IV. That was because sometimes your patient is ill. They might be warming out their oral tablet, first thing. Second thing, they, they might have hypoalbuminemia. When they albumin is only duapulo, their albumin only lima belas, they tend to have gut edema. When their intestine are edema, they can't absorb the oral medication. Then some ill patients, they might have a paralysis ileus or, or they might have diarrhea, their, their, um, their intestine movement are too fast. Then you wash away your oral antibiotic too fast or either they didn't absorb. That is the reason in a sickest patient, we prefer to use IV for the couple of uh, first few days. So after 48 to 72 hours, if your patient respond clinically, imaging, uh, imaging re respond, and the biochemically or respond, after two days, three days, you can always switch back to oral agent. So um, remember that I told you about time-dependence antibiotic uh, or our beta lactam antibiotic. You want to keep the concentration uh, throughout the course of, uh, Throughout the day, you want the antibiotic concentration above the MIC. Uh, so people found that, if, let's say uh, your patient already on meropenem 1 gram TDS in ICU, but due to uh, ESBL, Capsella, bacteremia, you already use meropenem. You already use a appropriate dose 1 gram TDS, but culture still come back same, ESBL, Capsella pneumonia, ESBL, Capsella pneumonia. Then, what, what is the mistake here and what else that we are not uh, optimizing, then PKPD come to a, a, a play, uh, come, come in a role here. So a uh, researcher find out that sometimes you already given the optimal dose, but unfortunately your, med your medication by given intermittent dosing cannot maintain the concentration above the MIC. So they propose that in an ill patient, which you believe that you can't maintain the concentration uh, appropriately, you can use continuous infusion. Instead of even uh, IV meropenem uh, uh, boluses, 30 minutes to one hour, you give it over four hours. Okay, so this is uh, another uh, uh, very new concept that we are applying nowadays, but it's more relevant in ICU patients. So next, uh, talk about uh, appropriate duration. A lot of people know how to choose antibiotic now. But, uh, everybody is very good to start in you uh, start using antibiotic, but the problem is we don't know when to stop. So the longer the better. I want to make sure the bacteria but to mati, you know. So I think one week at the brani after patient discharge another one week. Want to make sure no. If you give your patient unnecessary prolonged exposure, your patient will end up a lot of diarrhea, hypersensitivity. If uh, and antimicrobial resistance will set in. Then, if do, do I try to tell you shorter the better? No. If you didn't use the appropriate duration, your disease eradication didn't happen, your patient will come back with a relapse. This is just a general rule. For a very simple infection and uncomplicated bacterial infection, simple bacteremia, seven days. Pneumonia, seven days. Simple skin infection, three to five days. Simple UTI, five to seven days. When do we say simple? Simple means that there is no abscess formation. There is no devices. There is no catheter. Uh, simple means your, your host is not an immunocompromised host. So when you are dealing with complicated bacterial infection, complicated means there's presence of mastatasis uh, uh, foci, presence of device, presence of catheter, uh, immunosuppressed host, then patient might, uh, might require a prolonged antibiotic duration. If you are dealing with chronic infection, then yes, you even need a longer duration of antibiotic to make sure that the, the organism are killed and the disease are healed. If uh, you use it too long for an acute uncomplicated bacterial infection, you are promoting MR. If you use it too short, your patient will come back with also with more resistant organism and uh, morbidity and mortality. Lastly, you have decided this patient need uh, an uh, antibiotic. You already decide the correct antibiotic, correct dose, correct duration, but your handwriting like hantu. Uh, so your nurse, instead of two gram, your, your, your writing like one gram, your nurse serve one gram. So it defeats your effort of choosing the most appropriate antibiotic for your patient. And the poor machi pachi go back with a basket of medication and don't know what to take, thought your bathroom is a Panadol, 
uh, I do not have fever, I do not have a headache. So Panadol, Papaya Ambil, your battery won't be giving. So at the end, you must make sure that the dispensing uh, correct information have to go to the user. Don't worry, you no need to remember, oh, Dr. Ang, you are in ID, very easy. Of course, you remember how to treat acute infection, how long to treat a chronic infection. No, I don't remember. Okay, don't tell my boss, I don't remember. So I make sure my handphone have all these guidelines. All these guidelines, you can freely upload in the official website. You have this uh, national antibiotic guideline. If you don't want, we have Big Nang one. Uh, if you are from university, you have UNMC one. IPO also have their own guideline. ICU also have their own antibiotic guideline. You can choose anything that you like. Um, of course, you can choose uh, IDSA up to date, uh, MESCAT, but again, like what I told you, their, their uh, local registered data will be a bit different from us. Then might not be too appropriate. When you, when you look at their recommendation, you have to be extra careful. So it's all easier than say, isn't it? Very easy to say you are in ID, senang, senang cakap. Yeah, I understand. So I always believe that if I really want you all to, um, to, to, to absorb what I'm trying to tell you, we have to go by few case scenario. I, I think I have four case scenario here. Maybe you can stop me if uh, we run out of time. Okay. Okay, so, sure. Yeah. So all this case scenario is a real life scenario. I didn't uh, uh, tamba, garam, tamba, chukka or whatever. It's a real case. Let's see. 50 years old man, poorly control DM, and me for fever and a little bit of cough. Fever got documented uh, 38 degrees Celsius in ED, total Y lima blast, chest x ray as usual. Uh, you have to put under sunlight, la, you have to don't know how you have to uh, see from a different angle. Then you say, okay, la, peri high la, hazina. So, what is the diagnosis? I think everybody know this is CAP. Common, right? Every day we have CAP. So, let's see what happened. This patient admitted, given commenting, and sent up to the ward. Another temperature in the ward. So what the doctor do? Upgrade to Tazosin. The next day, still temperature, marrow So if you attend, you really pay attention to me. You know that, hey, Salah, Salah, Dr. Ang say, don't do that, right? CAP, uh, CAP co community, ma. You don't, you don't suspect a, 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 a multi-resistant organism, tapaya la, Tazosin, marrow So, hey, but patient respond, right? Correct or not? So, the MO come back, Dr. Ang, you, you, you all idea, but don't know. You see, you tell me don't use, you see, meropinum so gang, you know, so hair bad. I so malu, you no. Know? So immediately I go back to see this patient. Oh my God. I go around and teach patient, don't, uh, teach you all don't use a uh, high five antibiotic. And now maybe I'm wrong, you know. So I go back to see patient. Apparently, meropinum is not working. This temperature come down not because of meropinum. Actually, the diagnosis was wrong. Patient admit not for CAP. Patient admit for cutie abscess. The, the, the lady houseman clerk her in casualty and this a male patient, Malu want to let a lady doctor know. So he after admitted in the ward, he tell the male MO that actually I punya belakang under abscess. So IND a surgeon was called and they went in immediately for emergency uh, incision and drainage. So do you think meropinum help patient to render a uh, AFP brown? No, uh, it's the IND that help. So in this case, fever responded to meropinum? No, source control is the primary therapy. So do we really need to upgrade antibiotic urgently uh, in this case when your patient is not dying, your patient not on triple double inotrope? Do we really need to upgrade so urgently? No, usually we allow 24 to 48 hours for antibiotic to work. So sometimes people cannot tahan, you know, see fever, want to upgrade antibiotic, but patient walking around, you know, healthier than me, walking around in front of me and asking me, doctor, bagi bale la, and you want to upgrade meropinum, no need la. This kind of patient, you wait, you give time for your antibiotic to work. Then you ask yourself, this is a gluteal abscess. Could they assess what is the organism that you suspect? Only you choose the correct antibiotic. Remember, I teach you, ask yourself, where is the site and what is the organism? So could they assess step aureus, streptococcus species or E. coli because near to your rectum. So do your patient have a risk for um, uh, 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 multi-drug resistant organism? recent exposure, antibiotic, uh, your patient recent hospitalization, no. So what is the most appropriate uh, uh, management or antibiotic? So it will be 
Cosa ceiling to deal with your step aureus. Your nursing or menting can kill all your E. coli step aureus and streptococcus species. You don't need a tazosin and meropinum in this case. In fact, in this case, you need to drain out the abscess. Even without antibiotic, I believe the patient can discharge home. All right. So the most appropriate anti uh, uh, the management here is source control, then followed by appropriate antibiotic. So you do not need tazosin, you do not need meropinum. Okay, let's say you really cannot tahan. You see fever, you see this fever, you cannot tahan. You really want to upgrade antibiotic. And after augmenting, cafrazon, tazosin, follow your algorithm. So you cannot tahan, you want to upgrade, then you ask yourself. I'm teaching you how to, how to have a flaw of your mind, then you know how to choose antibiotic. If you really can't tahan the fever, you want to upgrade, you ask yourself. What tazosin can do, but omentin can't do? The answer is, tazosin can cover pseudomonas, omentin cannot. Yes. Tazosin can cover a more resistant strain, omentin cannot. Yes. So now you ask yourself, do you suspect your patient have pseudomonas in the cutia abscess? Is it common? No. Okay. Cutia abscess is not a common organism. Uh, sorry. Uh, pseudomonas is not a common organism to cause cutia abscess. Then why you want to use tazosin? No need. Just refer surgeon, drain it out, continue your augmenting. Let's say somebody already upgrade to tazosin and fever again. You want to upgrade to meropinum. Now, you follow back the same flaw of mine. You ask yourself, what meropinum can cover but tazosin can't cover? ESBL. Do you suspect your patient had ESBL? No. This patient never exposed to antibiotic before admission. This patient is not an ESBL carrier, never have an ESBL infection before. Then why do you need to upgrade to meropinum? Okay, so this is how you should ask yourself before you decide on escalation therapy. You don't need to remember how to treat. You book out your guideline, the answer is there. Augmenting for rectal gluteal abscess, drainage is required and the duration four to seven days uh, with adequate source control. You don't need to continue your augmenting until two months, one month. Common scenario uh, two, 56 years old man, and sectional failure on a HD via IJC, coming fever chills and rigo, uh, temperature 38, IJC site inflamed, chest is very clear. Everybody will agree with me. This is CRBSI. If we follow whatever guidelines, CRBSI, you need a good gram positive and good ne uh, gram negative coverage, IV photon, IV capazolin. So this is the fever spike. Now, and another fever spike, what do you do? You keep IJC because of precious line, upgrade to meropinum because photon not working, upgrade. Or you off IJC, but you continue photon capazolin. Or you off IJC at the same time you want to upgrade. You keep IJC, you thumb bar vancomycin. So what should you do? See what happened to this patient? IJC was removed. They didn't change the antibiotic and miracle occur. You don't need meropinum to show you miracle. Okay, you just need to remove the source and patient can become um, better and uh, the organism will just take away together, remove uh, with the source. So what happened? IV uh, cotton capazolin was continued. Blood culture came back and no growth. After one week, patient was discharged well. But given that z 250 BD for one week upon discharge. So what is the issue here? Do, do we still need a tablet z -net? What are you trying to treat? Do you, do you guys actually agree with tablet Zinac? No. No evidence of persistent bacteremia. Why do you need to give that Zinac? If you suspect of persistent bacteremia, because I asked the clinician, why do you need to give tablet Zinac? No, just in case. Ah. And stage renal failure patient, uh, immunocompromised. If let's say still got bacteria health, I just want to cover, I just want to be sure. If you really suspect persistent bacteremia, what is the appropriate management? It's not to discharge your patient. You should repeat culture. You should scan the patient, look for source. You should order a CT scan of the abdomen and the chest. If you still suspect bacteremia, you want to upgrade antibiotic rather than change to oral xena and let patient go home. If you let patient go home, means you know patient is recovered, no more organism. You have to believe yourself and you have to have confidence. You don't need to cover yourself just in case to give another week of oral antibiotic. Okay. So 
if you really think your patient has persistent bacteremia, what antibiotic you want to choose? After Fortum, you know it's tazosin or meropenum already. Then you ask yourself, what Fortum and kefa, uh, Kefazolin not cover that tazosin can cover, meropenum can cover? Then you have to go back to your patient history and case note to help you. If Fortum and Kefazolin and you remove the catheter, fever still spiking, patient are getting ill, patient getting more lethargy and more septic, it's not automatic upgrade to tazosin and meropenum. You go back and look at the patient culture. Oh, apparently two weeks ago, patient admit for MRSA and patient uh, nasal carrier or MRSA. So if I want to upgrade this case, I will give vancomycin. I won't choose tazosin. I won't choose meropenum. If you're going to use your algorithm meat, you upgrade to tazo or meropenum, you're actually killing your patient. Okay? So you don't need to memorize. Everything is in our guideline. IBSA guideline for CRBSI tells you if a negative culture, you remove the catheter. In fact, you don't need one week IV antibiotic. You should stop the antibiotic. You shouldn't, should not even give a one week or oral Zina. Okay? Case scenario three. This is a real case Does scenario. Up? Yeah. Up. yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I better stop here. Okay. Um, let uh... me move to my bring home message. Okay. Allow me okay. to last slide. Okay, so this is the bring home message. If you just wake up, everybody wake up now. You just wake up, you sleep nicely one hour. If you have a patient that you suspect for bacteria infection because of fever, because of hypoxia, because of high inflammatory marker or positive culture from non-sterile sites, okay, not, not the positive culture from your blanket, huh? okay, you really suspect of bacteria infection, First thing is not to think of what antibiotic, is to look for source, whether or not it's a catheter induced, IJC induced, is it a good abscess that you need to drain the abscess, then only you think what is the likely organism and what, uh, what current antibiotic patient is using and not working, where is the site and go back to your local, your hospital antibiogram, whether uh, performance of your, of your antibiotic, is it so good? Uh, it's not too good. That's why your patient not responding. So if you have already choose the correct antibiotic and you already source control, still poor response, fever spiking, not getting better, then you check whether the dose correct or not, the route and the duration. Maybe you give it two shots. Is all these are correct? Then you start asking back yourself, is it a real infection? Maybe this is not infection at all or maybe you miss a source. So don't keep on upgrade antibiotic. Go, 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 go back to this cycle and uh, think back whether the source is controlled or not, rather than keep on upgrading antibiotic before you, uh, be, before you optimize your dose, before you choose the correct antibiotic, okay? So yeah, time's constraint. Last slide. If you do not use the antibiotic wisely and you are welcoming superbug, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ang, for a wonderful elaboration on a very simple, to make it very simple and straightforward on how the process of prescribing an antibiotics. Uh, it, you make it easy. And also, I think the strong point is not all the fever is actually due to bacterial infections. We have uh, a lot of, uh, I will always laugh that infectious disease team is always uh, feverologist yeah. because uh, I think our MO said a lot of our colleagues in the ward where, where the patient is post-op or admitted for some other reason and then start to develop fever, they will refer infectious disease team. And then as a joke, my MO will always say that we are feverologist. So we are the one that actually went down and clocked a proper history. And of all you know, we have diagnosed a fair bit of uh, um, seronegative arthritis. We have diagnosed a fair bit of um, hematological malignancies. We have diagnosed a fair bit of um, psoriasis arthritis and also gouty arthritis. So these are a, a few points to stress that not all the fever is due to infections. 
And again, we I'm very happy that Dr. Ang also elaborated on choice of antibiotics. So if you are in, in your practice, it's good that you ask your hospital to give you a three monthly report. Usually they have a three monthly report of all the commonest bacteria isolated in your hospital settings. They can actually generate um, a report of community versus uh, hospital acquired, like for example, in intensive care uh, cultures versus in the common work cultures. But if you ask them to generate where which one is the community and, and which one is nosocomial, it is very difficult for some of the state uh, or some of the hospital laboratory because the culture forms, you know, the doctors never actually put in uh, the history for the culture samples to be sent. They just put blood culture or urine culture without any details whether this patient has been uh, taking antibiotic prior to, to this culture or the patient has multiple admissions in the hospital before. So they can tell you uh, whatever they can get, but generally we will have a report on what is the best antibiotic to treat for your organism. For example, you want to ask for Capsula Pneumo or for E. coli, what is the best antibiotic in my hospital? They, they actually had this report. So just walk down there or give a call to them. Usually they, you will see it. And uh, I think these are all very important measures because when, when you are practiced in a hospital, doesn't mean that when you are moved to another hospital, it will be the same. So it is very good to ha have a talk to your microbiologist also as well. Okay. Any questions from the floor? Uh, I saw them putting up Q&A. Instead of typing, maybe I can answer in this way. Uh, they are asking about, for eh, the first question gone already because it was answered. Uh, simple pseudomonas, uh, sorry, pseudomonas bacteremia. Do we need antibiotic for two weeks like MSSA? So uh, I already given the answer. If it's simple, you're sure that there is no uh, collection and you, for even for Pseudomonas uh, bacteremia, one week is enough. Unless you are dealing with a special population of patient like post-transplant, post-chemo patient when their neutrophil is zero. So in some time we do allow some extension and this is case to case basis. Then second question, for bacteremia, do you agree to extend antibiotic for at least total 10 days, calculated from the last repeated negative blood culture? So uh, it's quite similar to the first question. If your bacteremia, uh, uh, forget about MSSA or MRSA bacteremia, let's say E. coli, Klebsiella, if it's a simple bacteremia, simple means you are sure there's no collection and your patient is not a special host and... Um, your patient respond quite quickly, bacteremia one week. You, in fact, you do not need to have a, a, a culture clearance for non-MRSA or MSSA patients. But of course, if your patient respond uh, slowly, still uh, not getting better, require inotrope, cannot win off, then that is the patient you might want to repeat culture. And yes, you, you, you want to give an extra one or two days. Uh, that one's definitely not an issue. Um, third question, any difference to give tazosin 4.5 gram TDS and QID in normal renal function? Okay, for this um, TDS and QID, for this um, PKPD uh, uh, concept, uh, actually is more applicable in a critically ill patient because they have um, very, uh, very in their body's uh, physiological changes is very, very every day and every, every single second, their body volume or distributions and uh, everything is changing quite quickly. Uh, so all these are more applicable for critically ill patient. If your patient is well, uh, walking around in the ward, then actually uh, TDS, QID, it, it is not really matter for your patient. Unless you are suspecting or uh, you are dealing with a resistant uh, a, uh, very high MIC organism, then of course we want to push to the highest and the optimal dose that we, we, we can. 
So correct me, Dr. Chow, if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. So next, I saw rifampicin is high protein binding. If hypoalbuminemia, what should we do? Rifampicin is high. Dr. Chow, you want to try answer this? <laughs> okay. Um, I think rifampicin, we don't actually adjust the dose yeah. because it's an oral uh, agent and it is a very good bioavailability. Yeah. And I think there is a maximum dose for it. And we, if you exceed the maximum dose of 900 milligram a day, mm -hmm. you might actually risk of total bilirubin going up and also have, having issues with the liver. So most of the time we are using 600 to 900 milligram per day. Okay, so you don't have to adjust it up according to the weight, okay? Is there such a thing where prolonged antibiotic can cause fever? So this is what we call antibiotic fever or beta latent fever. Antibiotic fever can occur any time during the course. You don't need to wait until prolonged to see the effect. <laughs> Some people after 24 hours also start to have this effect. But antibiotic fever is a diagnosis or exclusion. Uh, we, we, we really can't find the cause and all the inflammatory marker, PCT, everything showed to us patients non-infectious. Only we will say this is antibiotic fever. How about bacteremia like strep pyogenes? Do we need blood culture clearance as well? So um, except from uh, fungal, uh, candida, MSSA, MRSA, Usually all other uh, bacteremia, we do, do not require a culture clearance, but case-to-case -case basis, your patient is really ill and you suspect that your patient uh, poorly respond, respond is really um, too slow uh, out of your expectation, then that would be the patient that you suspect could it be uh, uh, resistant already set in, you might not use a correct antibiotic because sometimes blood culture come back after 72 hours. So for the initial 48 hours, maybe you give an underdose of an initial antibiotic. So that is the time you want to repeat the culture. You might suspect that the first few days the antibiotic wasn't so inappropriate. Then you want to repeat, yeah. For MRSA osteomyelitis, I have seen a case that patient was given IV Venco for four weeks and tablet rifampicin was added for second on the second week for a total duration of four weeks. May I, may I know the rationale of that? Okay, so um, for uh, osteomyelitis, um, I hope this, uh, I'm not sure if your patient is having an implant inside or not. But for, there are some studies say that for MRSA, uh, uh, osteomyelitis or joint infection, uh, some, some people actually believe that giving a double agent. So that is the, they, they, they think giving dub, double agent will have a better uh, uh, eradication rate. And also rifampicin have a really good uh, um, bone penetration for osteomyelitis. But now what usually we do is uh, when patient have an implant, then yes. So I'm not sure if your patient have an implant or not, but I, I think your patient, you might talking, uh, you might talking about uh, implant retention uh, osteomyelitis. When we consider when, sorry, we jump. I think uh, time is catching up. Yeah. Can we choose one last question? And the rest of it, I try to answer with the. Uh, uh, shall we go for? So the job can I choose? <laughs> because okay. it's also, it's okay. also what I want to ask. <laughs> uh, this one, the question is how to choose between the kaba panels, so marrow or imi or whichever panel lah. <laughs> how do we choose between? <laughs> the last question. Okay. Mm, the last one. <laughs> you, you, you don't need to choose we don't have <laughs> well um in general i think in general there is actually some of the in between all the carbapenems there are some side effects that are different okay even though um in the literature it said that imipenem is more easy to induce some seizures compared to marrow and doripenem 
But I think overall, all the carbapenems uh, actually can induce some seizures to some extent. And how do you choose between them? And you look at the, 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 the ex extent of coverage. Uh, you have an ertapenum, which do not cover pseudomonas. That's what we call first generation. And then you have the venropenum, imipenum, and the doripenum. They are more gram-negative coverage. For imipenum, it has a little bit more gram-positive coverage than meropenum. Uh, meropenum and doripenum is the very potent gram-negative coverage there. But between meropenum and doripenum, it actually has not much difference of coverage in terms of, um, of the coverage of the, anti uh, the bacteria. But uh, I guess a yes. lot of people like to use doripenum in the, in the private side because it is a newer agent and uh, the price is almost the same as meropenum and doripenum in the private side. So um, to tell you the truth, how do you choose between uh, carbapenum in our government practice? It's all by price and by familiarity. So uh, a lot, I think a lot of physicians, they, they are very familiar with meropenum. And uh, a few physicians that actually like imipenem will stick on imipenem. So um, there's no hard rules. How do you choose between all these three carbapenems actually? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Ang. So Dr. you want to wrap up? Yes, yes, I think we should. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ping Ping. I think that was the best lecture I had on gluteal abscess. Now okay. I'm... I'm quite good at glucose <laughs> abscess now, so I have to look for a few glucose abscess to treat. Thank you very much. Uh, so you learn something every day, don't you? But jokes aside, I, I think uh, thank you very much for a very comprehensive and very pragmatic look at how we use antibiotics, looking at the main areas that we must consider before we start something. I think there are some key slides that you can take home based on Dr. Ang Ping Ping's presentation, but clearly uh, the way we normally use antibiotics, the, the way we escalate antibiotics uh, as a routine probably doesn't work anymore in our modern way of doing medicine. So uh, with that, I just want to remind everyone that we do have many pandemics at the same time. And two of the pandemics we are very aware of is of course the COVID-19. And the one we spoke about is on antimicrobial resistance. So I do hope that we will be a bit more careful, a uh, bit cognizant on what, on whenever we want to use antibiotics to think, of, put a bit more thought into it uh, before we venture into, into this area of, of treatment. So with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention for this afternoon. I think I know many of you are working. I know you have to go back to work, except me because I'm retired. Uh, so uh, and enjoy your, your, the rest of the week and stay safe uh, from COVID-19. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Dr. Chow, for uh, co-chairing with me. And thank you, Dr. Ang Ping Ping, for your gluteal abscess story. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Shall I pass it back to Mabel? Yes, thank you, Dr. Chris. Thank you, Dr. Ang and Dr. Chow. Uh, Mabel, so we will see you guys next week. Mabel, do you want us to answer these questions first? Or how? On type? Uh, type can. Okay. Dr. Ang can answer. Can. Uh, okay. Okay.
Yep, I think all, all have answered. Okay, thank you, everybody. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Ang. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Afi? Yes. Afi can save the can save the Q and A. Ah? Mm, I'm not sure, but I'm copying it into a word right now. Ha, okay, okay. You copy. Uh maybe you copy already, then after that, together with the video you post on to the Facebook site. Ah? Uh, okay. Okay. Then I can chow first. And then? Can I chow first? Ah, sure, sure. No problem. Bye, okay, Dr. thank you, Afi. Bye. Thank you, Dr.